Hi, it's Eva Cartman, and you're listening to the Dream Big Podcast Show, the place to go to learn, laugh, and grow. Today we welcome Dr. Kenneth Lacovera, who discovered a dinosaur that weighs seven times more than a T-Rex. He got to name it, too. And you're going to find out about his discovery and what he named this giant dinosaur in this episode. This is episode 94, Big Dreamers. You ready? It's time to dream big. Welcome to the Dream Big Podcast Show. We're inspiring you to shoot for the moon, take aim and go. We bring to you amazing guests who truly love what they do. Every day they're living their dreams, and so can you. Dream big, take action to reach your goals. Are you pumped yet? It's showtime, let's rock and roll. Welcome to the Dream Big Podcast Show. I am your host, Steve Cartman. And today, I'd like to start by telling you about a special gift we have for all you big dreamers. We created a super cool Dream Big Journal that we want to ship to you. And get this, the front of the journal has an illustration of an astronaut in outer space. What is so amazing is that the journal is printed and personalized with your own face and name. So you'll see your face on the cover of this journal as an astronaut. Oh, and it's free. We just have you cover the shipping. Parents, please go to dreambigpodcast.com slash journal to claim your free personalized Dream Big Journal while this offer is still available. You'll see a video of my mom and I showing our journals. Go to dreambigpodcast.com slash journal to get your free journal. Also, I wanted to thank you for all your recent reviews on iTunes. We are reading each and every one, and it brings a smile to our face to know the work we are putting into this podcast is helping so many people. Please do take a minute to leave a review if you're getting value from the podcast. Now... It's time for you all to enjoy our interview with Dr. Kenneth Lacovera. Dr. Lacovera has unearthed some of the largest dinosaurs ever to walk our planet. In his quest to understand these titanic creatures that strain the human imagination, Lacovera blends exploration in remote locations across the globe with the latest imaging and modeling techniques from engineering to medicine. I know that, like most kids, I've always been fascinated by dinosaurs. And I'm sure you will be fascinated by Dr. Lacovera's career. And it just shows again that if you have a big dream, you can make it your life's passion. As always, we have show notes at dreambitpodcast.com slash 94, where we will include links to Dr. Lacovera's website and everything we discuss in the interview. Without further ado, here's our interview with Dr. Lacovera. Let's roll the tape. Hi, Dr. Lacovera. Hi, how are you? Good. We are so excited to have this interview with you. Well, I'm excited to be here. Today is a very interesting subject, and I'm sure all the kids are going to be excited to hear all the way till the end because we are talking about... Dinosaurs. Yep. Yep. Big dinosaurs and they're extinct now but it's still really cool to learn about them because it's a past we want to know all about the history yes and we're going to spend most of our interview uh doctor on your incredible career is one of the world's foremost experts on dinosaurs yeah so um where'd you go up because we always like to like um get a little bit about um, our guest's childhood. So where did you grow up? We love finding out what brought them to today's career. And I feel like sometimes the childhood is a, a starting point to what are you doing today? Is that correct? Sure. Yeah, of course it is. So I grew up on the coast of New Jersey, uh, very close to the ocean. And so I was kind of like a surfer kid, spent a lot of time in the water. And um, there was really only sand and mud where we lived. There are no mountains, no rocks. Uh, and then one day I was in second grade and a woman brought a box of rocks and minerals and fossils into my Cub Scout meeting. 
And I had never really seen things like this before. And it really just blew my mind. And I got a, a, a little book. It was called The Golden Guide to Geology. And the next day I wrote an essay in second grade about igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rocks. Those are the three kinds of rocks. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that sedimentary rocks were the best kind of rocks because you can find fossils in them. And that really started my love of paleontology and geology. And I was lucky enough to kind of stay on that track with a little detour into music when I got older, but then back to science. And, and I turned out to be a paleontologist. Wow, that's so cool. And you know, mom, like, you know how kids are always fascinated about dinosaurs? Yes. Well, in this point, um, he was only in second grade and you were already fascinated about the fossils and everything that was in that little box that the woman brought to your meeting. Yeah, that's right. And you know, I think almost every kid goes through a dinosaur phase. And, you know, I think what kids really like about it is it's their first taste of really knowing something that maybe their parents don't know or their teachers don't know. You know, they memorize all the names. They memorize a lot of facts about dinosaurs. And it makes them feel really good about themselves. And it makes them feel like, you know, they're an expert in something. And so I think all kids like that feeling. And then you know, some of us uh, never lose our love of dinosaurs. And then if you stay in college long enough, you get a PhD and you can become a, a dinosaur paleontologist. So, um, doctor, at what point did you actually realize that you could make like a big career um, about where you were learning about dinosaurs and the fossils? Well, it was after I had graduated college and was in graduate school working on my PhD or my doctorate degree. And then I began to see that, you know, this is something that I really love. Um, I was pretty good at it. And I thought that, you know, I could really turn this into my life's work. And, you know, when you do the thing that you love for your work, it's just such a joy. Um, I get paid to explore the world and dig up dinosaurs that no one has ever seen and they pay me for it. So what could be better than that? Yeah, it sounds fascinating to travel the world and do what you love and uh, dig down in in uh, Earth, uh, Earth and find all incredible things. Yeah, and speaking of digging, um, I know that you found a dinosaur, a huge dinosaur fossil, like the a full dinosaur, um, that you named mm -hmm. the Dreadnoughtus. How did you find this dinosaur? That's right. So I found Dreadnoughtus at the very bottom of South America in what is called Patagonia in Argentina. Um, and I went down there because it had three key things that paleontologists always look for. You need to have rocks of the right age. And if you're interested in dinosaurs, they have to be from the Mesozoic era. That's when dinosaurs lived. Those rocks have to be made of sediment, meaning sand and mud that turned into rock. And those are the only places when you can, where you can form a fossil. And then today, it's very helpful if that place is a desert. So you get uh, a good view of the rocks and so that um, the weathering, the wind and the rain are always uncovering more and more fossils. It's not that these animals lived in deserts. It's that you need to go to a place that's a desert today so that you can have a really good view of the rocks. And so I could see on geological maps of the world that we had all the right conditions at this place at the bottom of Patagonia. And I went down there in 2004. And the way you look for dinosaurs is you just get yourself on the ground and you walk until you see a bone sticking out of the rock. And mm. when you're in the right situation, you see bones all the time. And so, you know, I would see thousands of fragments of bones and hundreds of actual bones. And you don't get too excited when you see those because usually it's just a little bit and, and those aren't very useful for science. But I uncovered this one bone. Um, it was maybe, you know, the part that I could see was about the size of a cereal bowl, but I kept uncovering it and uncovering it. And pretty soon it was a seven foot long thigh bone from a giant dinosaur. Wow. And then right next to it was the, Right next to it was the shin bone, and then some backbones appeared. And then five years later, we were digging up the 145th bone of this giant dinosaur that I later named Dread Dreadnoughtus. And 
Dreadnoughtus means fear is nothing. Dread is fear. Not is another way of saying zero or nothing. So Dreadnoughtus fears nothing. Hmm, that's cool. And I must admit, I think that the Dreadnoughtus has a much better ring to it than what like most dinosaurs are named. Like I bet part of the allure of the T Rex is that it has a great catchy name. So it's the same I thing with the Dreadnoughtus. I think you're exactly right. Well, right. thank you. And I agree. Tyrannosaurus Rex is one of the great dinosaur names of all time. Yeah. And um, would you realize when you and your team had actually made this discovery, uncovered the last bone, what was that feeling that you felt? Well, it was great. You know, when you, when you find a dinosaur like this, you're not only finding a skeleton, but you're really discovering a whole species. And so we had discovered a species that lived millions of years ago, about 77 million years ago. And there were thousands of them at the time. And, and we had, you know, just these bones. But, you know, all of a sudden there's this connection between you and these ancient animals. And you're the one that brings them to the world and brings them to light. And, and you know something that no human has ever known before. And when you have that experience, it's a great feeling and it's kind of addictive and you just want to keep doing it and doing it. And you know that underground there's so many more discoveries to be made. So all of the kids that are listening out there today, you know, we haven't found the last dinosaurs far from it. So if this is something you want to do with your life, most of the dinosaurs that ever lived are still out there waiting to be discovered. And I can relate to this feeling because when I was in my college, I have a uh, I grew up and uh, lived in Russia in Siberia till I was 21. So my major in college was history and psychology was second major. But history brought me after the first year, uh, brought me to archaeological tour where we in Siberia discovered uh, bones and like different things. Fossils. I don't, yes, uh, fossils. <laughs> exactly, Eva knows better. My English is my second language, as you can see. Uh, yes, but that's that's really, really fascinating because I remember that feeling when everyone screamed, we found it, we found it. And then yeah, carefully, carefully took care of it. When you said five years, you know, for some people, it, uh, it probably seems too long, right? But I just want to remind to our listeners and big dreamers that the process has to be so delicate it has to be involved like you have to involve brushes and little little like little knives right not yeah, knives like I had kind a of... kit and yeah. we had to uncover it was actually real dinosaur fossils yes can you explain us uh, doctor a little bit more about the tools that you use to actually uncover sure. the fossils um, well we we have a a very basic rule which is you use big tools away from the fossils and little tools near the fossils and so, you know, when you're 10 feet away from the fossil, you can use a pickaxe and a big tool like that. And then when you're a little closer, you might use a hammer and a chisel. And then when you're real close, you might use just a tiny little screwdriver or a dental pick or a brush or something like that. And we actually try to leave some of the rock on the bone because it's the rock that for all those millions of years has really protected the fossil. And when you start to take the rock off, the bones can start to expand and crack and you want to make sure that happens in your laboratory so that you can control that process and so that the bones don't get hurt. So we, we dig out the bones just enough and we leave a little bit of rock on them. And then we wrap them in burlap, which is a very coarse kind of fabric, and cover that with plaster, which is like plaster of Paris. And that's what we call a jacket. So we put a jacket on the bones and then we lift it out. And since you have bone and rock and burlap and plaster in there, these Jackets are very, very heavy, and they're really hard to get out of the desert. Mm -hmm. And how do you actually get it out? And where do you go like, next? Do you like take a like a plane or a jet and fly it over? Well, I wish, but um, <laughs> we never have that luxury. Some paleontologists manage to get helicopters into their site, and I've never been that fortunate. Um, my first year in Patagonia, we had to get all our supplies, all the plaster and burlap and, and everything, we had to get that across a glacial stream using rafts. And this was a really big, fast-moving stream. And then we had to um, get the bones out of the desert by jacketing them, putting, putting them on a metal sled that we built, padded out with prairie grass from the desert, 
And then we would tow the bones out with uh, teams of horses. Mm-hmm. Wow. Interesting, interesting. So um, does, does technology help you, doctor, nowadays, like to get the better picture of what you discovered? Well, out in the field where we find the fossils, not really. Um, you know, GPS is great and satellite phones are great. But there really isn't any technology that has uh, helped paleontologists find new bones. The best way is still to walk on the ground and to have a good set of eyes and to understand your geology. But then in the laboratory, now everything has changed because of technology. So in the laboratory, we're scanning fossils with 3D laser scanners. We're printing them with 3D printers. We're using CT machines or CAT scan machines to look inside the bones. We're cutting the bones open. And we're looking at thin sections of them under a microscope to look at the growth of the bone cells. We're dissolving little bits of the bone with acids and actually recovering proteins and blood vessels and blood cells. So out in the field where we dig up the bones, it's kind of the same as it has been for 150 years. But in the laboratory, now we're beginning to understand dinosaurs and beginning to to study dinosaurs in the same way that a biologist today would study a raccoon or an elephant or a lion or something like that. Hmm, I see. Yeah, and I'm curious from the perspective of a paleontologist and dinosaur lover, do you like do you like the um, Jurassic Park movies? Sure, I do. Um, there are a lot of paleontologists who uh, are scientists today because of those Jurassic Park movies. And, you know, they're a lot of fun. The, the graphics are great. What I always tell people is, you know, Jurassic Park and Jurassic World, these are not textbooks. So, you know, it's a fun summer monster movie. Go and have a good time. And if that excites you about dinosaurs, then what I recommend is you go down to your local library and get some books and, you know, really then learn the facts about dinosaurs, which you're not going to get from the movie. But from the movie, you'll get a lot of inspiration and a lot of fun. I agree. Yeah. We got a lot of inspiration for dinosaurs when we went to uh, Universal Studio on Jurassic Park exactly. <laughs> ride. Yeah. And uh, even yeah. though Eva more, was more excited about getting wet on the ride than <laughs> yeah, the dinosaurs. The <laughs> but I think uh, just little bits and pieces and get kids closer and closer to it. Yeah, and it's uh, it's so cool that we can learn a lot from history and and understanding our planet's past. And I uh, watch your TED Talk, and as you mentioned in your TED Talk, the dinosaurs could not have done anything to, like, avoid extinction. But humans um, are aware of what our actions mean for the environment, and we really have to be more aware of how, like, we're harming the planet and what actions we can take to make sure we take care of it because we want to save every single of the planet's moments and like the grass, the trees, everything could be gone. I don't know if I could put it better than that, Eva. That's exactly right. And, you know, it's so nice to hear a young person like yourself with that knowledge and with that attitude. And you're exactly right. You know, the dinosaurs died because of a cosmic accident, right? The earth got hit by an asteroid. There was nothing they could do about it and they went extinct. But now we humans we're really damaging our environment and we're causing global warming to happen and we're causing the seas to rise and we're causing lots of species to go extinct. But we know it's happening and we know what to do about it. So we really all need to get together to solve these problems because, you know, if you step back from Earth and you look at Earth from space, it's this tiny little lifeboat that all of us are on. And there's not much to it when you back up far enough. And, you know, space is a very harsh place. And it's the only home that we have. It's the only home we've ever had. And we really need to take care of it. It's so true. And, uh, Doctor, we know you released a book last year entitled Why Dinosaurs Matter. Can you tell a little bit more Mm -hmm. about it? And uh, what can can our readers... And why dinosaurs do matter? Yes. And what can our readers find in that book? Sure. So, um, you know, the book is called Why Dinosaurs Matter, but it could just as well be called, be called Why the Past Matters. And the reason why the past matters is because, you know, we have all these threats and problems that have to do with the environment today. And, and we're sailing into this environmental future that could be great, but could also be very 
perilous, very dangerous for us. And how are we going to get the information that helps us make the best decisions about our environmental future? Well, the only place where that information resides is in the past, right? I mean, the present is just an instant. It's really nothing. And the future, we don't have access to the future. Nobody remembers the future. We can't do experiments in the future. So where is this information going to come from? Well, we have to look to the Earth's past. We have to look at what happens when the climate changes, what happens when sea level changes, what happens when extinctions occur, when new species come onto a continent. Well, these things have happened many, many times in Earth's past. This time they're happening because of humans, but they have happened more slowly in the Earth's past because of natural causes. And so there are many, many answers out there in the rock record, in the fossil record, and we would be very foolish if we didn't take advantage of those to help us have a better future. Yeah, and we've said it time and again, Big Dreamers. Um, I hope this proves once again that you can actually follow your passion and have a successful career doing what you love. Like, we've had a professional yo-yo artist, a mentalist, a general, <laughs> and now a dinosaur expert. Exactly, and then you can be the one who saves the planet. And as the uh, doctor just said about... Uh, saving our planet and do what matters and taking care of it. Just do what you can. Every day, little by little, you'll see a big difference in this world. Yeah. That's right. And, you know, when you think about that dream that you have, I mean, maybe it's to be an astronaut, maybe it's to be a ballerina, maybe it's to be a brain surgeon or anything. Maybe you want to be a carpenter or a plumber. When you think about the future, somebody is going to do that job and that person is going to be a person, right? A people, just like you. And so yeah. why couldn't that be you? So somebody's going to do it. So it could be you. If, if that's your dream, that's so you know, true. there's a way that you can make it happen. Yeah. If you have a dream, take action, and that could reach to your goals. That's so right. um, so Dr. Lacavera, um, now we're going to ask some like quick questions, and then you quickly answer. It's like the middle of the interview, like... We love to find out more about our guests and our listeners love to see what your life looks like a little bit um, behind the scene, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not only as a dinosaur expert. Yeah. So um, what are your plans for the future? Well, my plans for the future. So I am the dean of the School of Earth and Environment at Rowan University in New Jersey. And part of my job is that I am also director of the Edelman Fossil Park. And so we have this amazing fossil site in southern New Jersey, very close to Philadelphia, where we have the, the actual fossils that represent the last moments of the dinosaurs. And so right now we're building a, a big museum. It's going to be a 40,000 square foot museum with state-of-the-art exhibits and a virtual reality chamber and a gift shop and a nature trail and a paleontology themed playground. And people are going to be able to come from all over the world to southern New Jersey and uh, learn about dinosaurs and learn about their past and learn about how to take care of the planet in the future. That's very interesting. I think our listeners' ears perked when they th uh, heard virtual reality tours. <laughs> well, so, yeah. here's something else your listeners will like. So we have, we have a fossil layer down in the bottom of our, of our quarry that we... Uh, do our research on and we protect that and excavate it very, very carefully. But above that, there are layers where we let the public collect. And so every kid, every parent, everyone who goes to this fossil park, if they're not afraid to get their hands dirty, and if they try a little bit, they find a 65 million year old fossil with their own hands that they get to take home. Oh my and God. And that's just an amazing experience wow. for the kids that go there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Kids so you have are to come out and that. take some fossils for yourself. We definitely will do that. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing. We'll definitely include all the links in our show notes and our uh, listeners will be able to find out more information about it. Yeah. Great. So for you, right what now is we, um, mm -hmm. so right now at the fossil park, we, uh, we're in the process of building the museum. So we're only open for special events, but in three years, we'll be open every day around the year. And everybody who wants to come dig fossils with us will be able to. Fascinating. Wow. And the time that's flies, so, so we'll cool. be soon. Yeah, we'll be there soon. So, um, yep. for you, what does it mean to be successful? Well, you know, there are different ways that you can define that, right? Um, for me, it's not 
necessarily money. I mean, it's, it's nice to have a good amount of money, but um, doing something that you love, I think, is, is really a way to be successful. And then, you know, what really matters for me is, you know, my family, my son, my wife, um, friends. Um, and so those are the things that really make life uh, rich and meaningful. And so, you know, having, having that and having a, a career where you're doing something that you love, um, you know, for me, that's what success looks like. And doctor, how does typical dead work look for you? Do you travel a lot? Are you constantly on the go? Or you um, you mentioned that you're dean uh, at the university. Like, what is it like yeah. to be you? <laughs> well, I'm a pretty busy guy. Um, so I spend uh, part of my time um, building and running the new School of Earth and Environment. And, and we have a department of Uh, geography planning and sustainability, a department of geology and a department of environmental science. And then I spend a lot of time as the director of the fossil park, uh, raising funds and talking to people and building enthusiasm. And, you know, now in the design of the museum and soon to be in the building of the museum. And then I spend a lot of time in my laboratory and I try to spend as much time as I can outside in the field and actually digging up fossils. I was digging up fossils today, actually, right before this interview. Mm. And um, so I'm, you know, my, uh, my work life is quite full, but it's all really fun, interesting stuff that, you know, I hope will make a difference in the future. And most importantly, you love what you do. That's what matters. Yeah. So I do. That's right. So, Doctor, if you go back in time and talk to your 10-year-old self or 9-year-old or whatever year old self you want to talk to, what would be the best advice? Well, I think I would uh, tell myself that uh, there is definitely a way to make your dreams happen and, um, you know, that all the hard work will really pay off. And that wasn't always obvious to me when I was young. Um, my father was a carpenter. Uh, neither of my parents went to, to college. They they didn't actually even graduate high school because of World War II. And so it wasn't very clear to me um, how to have a, a career that was, you know, based on going to college and then becoming a professor. So the whole thing seemed um, kind of confusing to me when I was younger. And I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to find a way to make it happen. And, you know, I guess I would like to tell the the 10 year old me that, you know, there is a way to make it happen. And, you know, you may feel confused now, but you'll figure it out along the way. Mm, thank you. And when you doubted yourself in the past, what way made you overcome those fears and continue to go on? Well, you know, one thing that really had a big effect on me was um, there was an astronomer named Carl Sagan. And um, he had a great way of uh, conveying scientific information to to the public and to young people. And when his book called The Cosmos came out, um, I read that and that was at a really important time for me in college. I, I was thinking about uh, majoring in music and I was thinking about majoring in, in geology. And when I read The Cosmos, I realized that, you know, I have to be a scientist. This is the thing where, you know, where my passion really is. And, um, you know, I'm still a musician today, but, Uh, you know, I followed the course of making um, geology and paleontology my career. Oh, um, yeah. So when you were a paleontologist in your young, younger self, you just got to like be ready and find your way through paleontology. Yeah, so, that's right. And, you know, the other thing is really when you see an opportunity, take it. Um, you know, most of the success that I see, whether it's, you know, paleontologists or my fellow TED speakers, I mean, these are people who had opportunities in their path and they could have passed those opportunities by and it would have been easier. It would have been easier to say, oh, I don't know if I can do it or, oh, that sounds like a lot of work. Um, but all of these people took the opportunities that were in front of them and they, they seized those moments and it, it led to their success. And even if it's uncomfortable, get out of the comfort zone and, and just know that this is a step to your brighter future, perhaps. Well, yeah. that, that is a wonderful point. And, and 
I'd like to touch on that if I could. So, you know, one thing that I always like to tell students is forget about comfort. I mean, you know, it's nice to have a roof over your head and, and a meal and things like that. But, um, you know, if you're sitting on your couch and you're playing video games and you're eating a bag of potato chips, you're extremely comfortable, right? Yeah. Um, but is that going to be a meaningful experience five years from now, 20 years from now? Are you going to remember that moment? Probably not. But when you're doing something like digging up a dinosaur at the bottom of Patagonia, you're never, ever comfortable. Your hands are bruised and calloused and sometimes bleeding and you're always cold and the wind never stops and you're hungry a lot of times and you're, you're tired. But none of that matters because you're doing work that you love. You're doing work that's important and you're making discoveries that no one has ever seen before. And none of that will ever, ever happen if you chase comfort instead yeah. of chasing experience and meaning. And I might say uh, all of these jobs and uh, yours in particular changes people's lives, changes perspective, changes maybe the course of history. But people don't know something and then you discover it and it changes changes history. So thank you so much for following your dream, for not being comfortable sometimes yeah. and taking action. <laughs> and speaking of dreams, what is your big dream for the future? Well, um, uh My big dream is to um, build a fossil park that uh, will attract people from, from all over the world um, and that will inspire people to both learn about the past and to um, consider what we're doing to the planet now. And I hope the result will be that they will um, treat this planet a little more gently and uh, take care of it a little bit better so that uh we can all have a better future they I definitely agree. will and we'll put all the links um in the show notes to the fossil um museum and, and the book. book and TED talk yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> so um for a very last question where can our audience find out more about you um well they can go to kennethlacovera.com Um, or they could go to TED.com and, and watch my TED Talk, or they could go um, on Amazon or your local bookstore and buy a copy of Why Dinosaurs Matter. That's okay. great. Thank we'll you so much for sharing Thank all the information, you. and we will include, as Eva mentioned, everything in our show notes. And we would like to summarize this interview by, by saying, as usual, big dreamers, Follow your dreams. You never know what the future has in store for you. As yeah. Doctor mentioned so earlier, take action. First, think of don't a dream. look uh, for comfort all your life. Yeah, right? think of a dream, take action. Don't look for comfort and make that dream a reality. And sometimes you must <laughs> maybe don't know what uh, how you're gonna make it happen. Uh, as Doctor mentioned before, yeah, he just didn't go know. With the flow. He he didn't know what's gonna be for for him as a career, but look, he take took one step at a time and made this huge discoveries. He's on stage. He was on stage um, as a, taught, a TED speaker, and uh, now opening museum that we hope all of you will visit one day and actually can dig and hold in your hands the fossils that are and home. take it home. Like, How how many how many thousands of years old, Doctor? The fossils. Uh, the fossils there are about sixty-five million years old. Sixty-five million. Sixty-five <laughs> yep. million. Just put this number wow. on the paper and then yeah. and, and then all go the over there and get yourself a fossil. Maybe <laughs> Now, yeah, but very soon, and we'll definitely put it in our bucket list, right, Eva? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor, so much. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. It was so fun. And uh, well, it's been I, my pleasure. I I really I, I really think that you with this interview and I know for sure that with this interview you inspired a lot of big dreamers uh to maybe become dinosaur experts. You never know. Yeah. So please write us comments and uh, write us your uh, maybe your dream career, maybe Uh, you did decide to yeah, be a dinosaur. Yeah, but and also get, um, also get um, the book, Why Dinosaurs Matter. And when the museum opens, go over there, get yourself a fossil, and look at all the other cool fossils. Yes. Thank you Thank so much. You. And we'll talk to you soon again, I hope. Bye. My pleasure. Bye-bye.
How fascinating was that interview? I think that may go down as one of our most popular ever. As I know, so many of our big dreamers, like me, are fascinated by dinosaurs, and think it will be super cool that we had on a real life dinosaur explorer. Be sure to check out our show notes at dreambitpodcast dot com slash ninety four for links to Dr. Laco Vera's website and everything else we discuss in the episode. When you go to the show notes, you'll see a place to sign up for our insider newsletter, where we send exclusive content, including a free audio that I made on my top ten tips for making and keeping great friends. This audio is only available for those who subscribe. And I know this will really help you, so please be sure to have your parents join the newsletter to get it. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Eva Cartman reminding you that you have unlimited potential. Your dreams are not optional; you need to make them essential. So take massive action to turn those big dreams into reality. Live with passion, the way life is meant to be. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.